Hey, good morning. Day three at Interfex Live. Oops, sorry, did I shock you folks? All right, hey, winter's back, by the way. Unless you, have, unless you had the, per, the, the privilege to have a cab, it was uh, a little chilly on a walk over. So welcome to the Javits Center. Today, uh, Interfex Live, our first guest is uh, Joel Russo. Joel is an expert in the area of risk analysis, risk-based um, approach when we use it. To me, uh, being a techie, my problem is always everybody says, well, we're going to use, we're going to do a risk base. Well, to me, what, you know, that means what, flip a coin or, you know, what, what do you want to do? So I always have to depend on folks that have a lot more logical approach to things in life. So, you know, they show me what tools to use. Otherwise, I wind up screwing it all up. So, so that's why we kind of put this as what's your risk analysis look like? I have no clue. So. I think the first thing we talked about, and Joel and I took, kicked this around a couple of times, and one of the things we want to talk about is, so when we say risk-based, I mean, what's the first go-to thing? Am I supposed to be reading IC, is my, Q9 or what? I mean, what am I supposed to be doing? Generally, um, Q9, uh, the IHC Q9 is the first place that a lot of people go um, to get a baseline of what they should be looking at. There are some limitations to Q9, but in terms of quality risk management, and this is from uh, the World Health Organization, they identify quality as the degree to which a set of inherent properties of a product, system, or process fulfills the requirements. Risk is the combination of the probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of that harm. And the management of that is the systematic process for the assessment, control, communication, and review of the risks to the quality of the drug. One of the problems with Q9 was pretty basic. The, the language that was being used, language that we may use and language that is used in another culture, they don't always line up. So for a long time, uh, there was some pushback with Q9, what exactly does it mean? It's really a guide, it's, it's not, it's not, um, um, mandatory, should, it's not a requirement, but it's definitely a guide. And you really have to, when you look at a risk program, you have to take into account what resources do you have on hand to do that? Because if you spend a whole lot of time developing a risk management program, but don't have the manpower to sustain that, which to me, the sustainability of being in a compliant state by using risk analyses and then using them again to go back and see if any of your products are out of control points. Some of the things that you would look at is what materials are you, uh, are you using? What manpower do you have? What methods are currently being in use? the measures that you're using, your facility and your machines, mother nature, the environment, and management. So depending on how robust your, your skeleton um, business structure is, and also depending on the severity of whatever risk is introduced into a product that could potentially harm a patient, um, those are generally categorized first. If I were to go into a small, a small company, a startup company, and they say, well, we want to implement um, a risk-based system using risk analyses. Personally, I'm, I'm a system-based guy. So I would look from the second the raw material comes in the door until it's actually sold in wherever it is being sold. Well, let me ask you this before sure. we go to, Sure. But, you know, I think people immediately go to the, go to process, an idea, you know, what, what, what am I, so what do you, what do you do first? I mean, do I pick a tool? Do I, what do I pick? What, what's well, the, the first thing to do is you really have to sit down with a cross-functional team that understands the process and or the system to identify your critical control points. That's really the, that's really the guts of it. Once, once you identify the critical control points, things that you need to be on top of in order to 
ensure a compliant product or process or system in the end is really you know the guts of it and then you have to rank them and then there's ranking and filtering and there is multiple ways you can do that I'll get into a couple of those in a bit um, what you were gonna ask yeah Sure. Well, okay. Well, once you, once you. Why don't we do that? Yeah. Yeah. Once like you. Like I said, I'm here to learn myself. So. <laughs> and it's you know, when you talk about probability, it's 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 kind of a grayish area. It's kind of a philosophical question. And I read when I was doing some research, they said, well, if it if the news tells you that there's going to be a 50 percent chance of rain tomorrow. What exactly does that mean? Does that mean 50% of the area that they're talking about is going to have rain all the time? Or is a given um, area going to be rained on for 50% of the day? It's, it's kind of gray. It's a gray area. So getting into, to, I mean, risk is basically probability and severity and then entering into a level of detectability because if something can go very wrong but it would be very difficult to pick up you you know may want to keep an extra ear or, or watch over that to make sure that doesn't sway out of compliance but once you've identified all of your con uh, critical control points which are basically the points where you would introduce problems basically or, or where problems could be introduced. For example, in an aseptic filling process, every time uh, a tank is open, that's a, that's a critical control point because bacteria particles can go into your tanks and adulterate your, your product. So you generally want to build, build that in from the beginning and you know, it should be uh, built into the validation and the development stage. But once you do get all of those control points, you want to list them in the list of, um, in rank of severity. And they give, there's numerous ways you can do it. And it's really, you have to tailor it to your own system, your own company. But an example would be putting a matrix together, very simple, low, medium, and high. You look at the probability on top, the severity on the bottom, and you would fill in your boxes. You know, what, what is low, you know, what is low probability of something going catastrophically wrong? So calibration of instruments, it depends. What is, what is that instrument going to do? Um, the supplier of your products, are you getting non-conformances from your supplier? That could be a medium risk. Um, warehousing and maintenance, depending on the, uh, f the history of the facility and the process. You know, I mean, they have it written, it could be low, but I, I've seen warehouse situations that introduced bio burden into the products because of where the warehouse was located in, in relation to, their, to the clean rooms. Um, but in terms of, of ranking, a couple of things you can do. Um, identify head topics. Now, the head topics could be your, your maintenance, your engineering, your production, and your quality. Okay, let me just stop sure. you there for a minute. So in other words, if I wanted to evaluate, let's just say a, a standard oral solid dosage for chronic. So, and I want to look at it from, you know, weighing to completion. Okay. Do I assign these topics across that as well, or how do I do that? No, I would gather I would gather all of the, the critical points first, and then look at it on a spectrum, and then see what you're dealing with, and then use one of many tools to to rank them and put a put a number to it. And, and that's where I kind of have a little bit of a a problem with some. I mean, some of the things that I was seeing was um, you could have minus ten, a range of minus ten to plus ten. And the higher the number is over zero, the higher the risk of the, uh, of the product or, or the process. You know, to me, it, it's, a, it's a Likert scale type, type of a 
science in a way, but what it does, and it's not meant to give, you know, incredibly accurate um, uh, results, but what it does do is it shows you what to look at first and what you may not have to spend so much time on. Um, also, I mean, it comes down to GMPs too, because a lot of the risk uh, categorization comes from um, looking at the documentation system as a, um, as a whole from a GMP standpoint. Um, and exactly what, you know, what product is being made? Is it, a, is it an aseptic product? Is it a, is it a powder? Um, is it a solid dose? So there's a number of, um, of schemes that could be used. In the well, and who supplies the numbers? <laughs> yeah, okay, I mean, yeah, great. I mean, I could put them in, but so what are we talking about here? To me, it's, it's relativity. I mean, they, there are scores. I mean, you could calculate risk analysis scores. Like an example here, the criteria would be the potential for patient harm. In their score range, that could be from a zero to 10, and their actual score was five. What does that tell us? I, I don't really know. It's, to me, it's kind of voodoo in a way. But what, like I said, what it does is it gives you a broad view, what you should be looking at first, um, what you should be possibly, and this is a good point, if you're having a problem in one area and you're developing something else or you're revamping a procedure or you want to revalidate a process or, or, or whatever the case, you can go back and, and do that. And whatever you choose to use, it, it should be living. Um, and one of the big product, one of the big product, uh, some, I'm sorry, problems with Q9 is that it stifles innovation. Um, it really doesn't, it, it kind of keeps companies caged in as, as to what they can do. Because traditionally you want to see a quality system really not change that much. And when a company has that, they have the impression that, okay, we're, you know, we're, we're covered. But in the meantime, if you're having excursions and investigations and, you know, God forbid a warning letter or a 483 or, or, or even worse, um, you want to have something in place to say, "Hey, this is what we're, this is what we're being." Okay, so let me see if I got it straight. I mean, one of the ways, you know, I spent many years in a large pharmaceutical company. Um, we used to look at, well, one of the ways I presented is Q8, Q9, and Q10 form yes. the foundation of a quality of a of a design. Yes. Right. And Q8 was what I did. Yes. Okay. And Q9 was what somebody else did. So I looked at that as they were the guys who put up the safety net. Should I fall off the trapeze while I was trying to do what I was doing? Yeah. Right. And Q10 was the guys that came in later and enabled everything to happen. Manufacturers. Right. Yeah. Yes. So how does that all, I guess what I'm trying to understand, how this all plays in. Yeah. Well, the QA, QA is really where the, where the risk mitigation should be introduced because Q8 is more focused on the development side and the Q10 is more focused on the manufacturing side. Q9 is kind of in the middle. They, in order to, like I said, it's, it's not a requirement, but it's a guide that a lot of people turn to first and then they tailor it to their own needs. Um, so Q9 gives the, the outline for you to you know, a skeleton to, to build the meat on, but they generally will look at, again, probability, severity, and, and detectability. Um, in terms of Q8. Well, let me ask you this, detectability. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, just, yeah. So everybody, we're in a place where we have analytical procedures we test. Yes. So what are we talking about? Detectability, detectability that a meteorite hit my, my, my planet or maybe so what are we talking about? Well, here's, here's an example. I have a mic, uh, microbiology background. Um, I worked on validating a system once. It's called uh, Tempo by uh, BioMariu. And what it does is automatically gives a total, what would be a total play count of how many, how much bio burden is in, is in a sample. 
the problem is there were one or two organisms because of it, it, it had a light fluorescence and the tempo uses light, it wouldn't pick up those two bugs. And one of those two bugs are on the list of things that, or a list of bugs that the FDA doesn't like to see in product. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't, you can't detect it, but it was severe because that's specifically one of the organisms that, that the FDA keeps an eye out in, in red flags. So when I validated this, I proposed we still need to do something to, to test for this particular bug. Um, so perhaps if that were thought of, if that was thought about from the beginning, maybe they wouldn't go forward with buying that that piece of equipment. I understand. I, I think I get it now. But it, so in other words, this gets back to what we were talking about with a cross-functional team. Yes. I mean, a classic example is you, in, in my experience, uh, I can only, I think the best way to do this is always look at case studies. Yes. And ask the best way to, to ground yes. this. Um, you get a, uh, re you get a report of an irritation and an eye product, right? Whether it's a device or an ointment or whatever. Mm -hmm. As it turns out, this irritant manifests itself from something whose levels we had deemed as acceptable. Okay. Or worse yet, it's something whose whose levels we determined was not going to be particularly important. Right. All right. So, the question really there is, it seems to be more of an allergenetic allergen type of thing. Okay. So, in that case, I mean, it was always there. So what happened? It was not, so you can't say well it was non detectable. Well, yeah, it was detectable. You measured it. Right. So what I'm saying is, how do you how do you get it? It should have been from the beginning. So what is the beginning? I mean, what do we do here? Well, you have to do, you develop a baseline, and it should be developed in such a way that is it's understood that it's going to be revamped, because there are very legitimate you know reasons. You know, we can get a, a panel of a dozen people that know something about the process and the system, but when it when it comes down to it, there are things that we just get surprised about. You know, like in the, um, you know, the Apollo 13 mission, I mean, there were so many things that they didn't think about and they had to, you know, rush and, and get it, you know, get, get the, uh, the vessel back into, um, get back, back into play. Um, All right, let me, let me just ask you this then. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that when we're, when we're so, I find a lot of time is waste. Well, I'm not wasted, but I find that companies and clients in particular they love to spend three days talking about what's critical and what's not critical. I mean, to me, you know, it's like you know. What, so the answer comes down to: Is that something we apply this as, or what do we determine is critical? I mean, what's the deal? Well, answering answering that and and also continuing your your, your previous question. With the case with the with the eye irritant, you have complaints by com uh, by customers that come in, and hopefully investigations are done based on those complaints. If it's a if it's a problem with the formula, I mean, hopefully that would be caught during development. Certainly, it could happen. The, or or a batch of product had some form of contaminant in it. Everything needs to be traceable. It needs to be documented. If from the ground up you're using GMP principles, um, you'll probably do, it, and you have the right intents, because a lot of times when, when you list and rank um, hazards, sometimes the hazards that are on the top of the list, workarounds are made around those. And sometimes they're, they're not optimal, sometimes they're not completely in compliance, but that's why this risk mitigation tool, whatever is using, whatever the, a company is using, um, should be a br living, breathing organism, and more importantly, from a cultural and and um, moral level, the your employees that are stakeholders in what they do, they work with these products all the time. In my opinion. You know, assemble subcommittees. You know, get all of those critical control points out, and you know, use use your expertise. I mean, nobody, you know, knows these products more than than those that are 
that are either making it, qualifying it, validating it, auditing it. Um, a lot of times it's facilities and it's not very easy to just, you know, say, well, our, our facility is out of compliance, we're, we're going to shut down. That usually doesn't happen. Um, I mean, I was in, um, I've seen a situation where um, it was a liquid filling operation that I was involved with. And the company was using a, they had a powder filler that was already in and installed, validated. Now, powder fillers, when a vial moves underneath the filling needle, powder will basically shoot directly into the vial. And what that will do is create a lot of particles. And when you're making a powder, that's allowable. But when you're manufacturing an aseptic liquid that's gonna be injected into infants, we wanna know what is around that open vial. So the machine basically would put the vial underneath and it would shoot powder in it. What it should be doing, a liquid filler would dip into the, into the vial and then slowly fill as it came up. After about four months of investigating, calling in the, you know, the big gun consultants in micro, um, we figured out that the actual liquid was causing splashback as well as vapor that the particle counter was picking up as pieces of, of vapor. So, and we, you know, the unfortunate thing was there was a liquid filling machine and it was in the warehouse, just needed to be validated and put in. Um, and the client didn't, didn't, they just wanted to keep going on with retrofitting. Let's keep slowing the line speed down and it won't splash as much. So their first mistake was using something that wasn't designed to be used for the application. Exactly. I don't know exactly if they even used a risk assessment. And, you know, I've been walking around here for the last couple of days or so. And I've, you know, I've been asking, you know, in your development process, what, what sort of risk mitigation do you use to ensure that your, that your product is of quality and compliance, I didn't get very many good answers. So I don't know if that really happens that much during development. I think I think it happens more than we like to admit. It's yeah. sort of like talking about family problems. We don't we don't have those as <laughs> yeah, right. someplace else. So um, the, the thing I wanted to the thing I wanted okay so you got this team together. All right. And let's just stick with your uh, powder slash liquid filler. Sure. The displaced child there as a case may be. Um, and it was a squatter. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was squatter. <laughs> better yet. So, what 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 tool do you put on a table if you were? So, I assume that you you uh, you, you would have you coordinated this. So, what sort of tools? How did you arm people? What did you tell them? How'd you get this thing moving? Well, basically, it was a um, it was a process validation project. So, what ended up happening? We didn't have a we didn't have a meeting on risk. We were we were pro, well not proactive, we were responsive to the problem. So we were responding, kind of fighting fires as they came up. We never said, okay, we're gonna stop everything. We're gonna run this through a risk um, analysis and then we're going to you know, revamp up again. Uh, I mean, the client had a timeline, you know, they had an ANDA to put in. Um, so a lot of times that doesn't happen. When I've used risk in, um, say, computer system validation projects, we would always look at, can this step result ultimately in a state where the product will be um, compromised and it will cause harm to the patient's safety? And you know, safety, efficacy, purity, uh, purity you know, everything that, that goes along with that. But, at, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the times, that's, that's one unfortunate option, is to choose to do nothing until something comes out. And for a very small company, you may get compassion from the FDA. If you, if you have the right intentions, you're documenting everything, um, you're, handling, you're handling things res responsibly with what you have. Um, but then again, if you look at the GMPs, you're supposed to be staffed 
adequately to produce you know your product so you can that can go either both I ways found that in our industry to, that the road to hell is usually paved with good intentions yeah so yes. let me let me um so i guess i guess where i'm where i wanted to find out is i want to you know what would be a go-to is there a go-to type of tool at fmea accp what what what, what, what where do you or is it just happens to be homegrown or what do we do um, what I've seen, I mean, I have, I have experience in pharmaceuticals, med device, I've seen nutritionals, I've seen food, and medical gas. I've seen different risk analyses being used for different industries. Um, I see in the gas industry, it's highly reliant on the failure mode, um, FMEA analysis. Um, and they also use the um, HACCP, which is Hazard uh, Assessment of con uh, Critical Control Why Points. Why one over the other then in their case? They do both, they I do think, both. to cover. Yeah. I think to cover. I love failure mode because, it, you know, you basically try and make things not work. And then when they do, you, you pass. You, know, you, you throw the kitchen sink at it, and if, it's, if it holds up, you know, it's almost like if you're publishing a journal article, you're going to be grilled by 20 PhDs. And if you're still standing, then what you have there is valid. Um, well, they missed it in the first place. I think that we always get back to that. If, yeah. And you'd like to think most of the time there's surprises. But, but when you choose to use a powder filler to fill a liquid, you know, that's... That's a different level. You know? let, me, let me ask you another question sure. then. I found a lot of people, they think by having a specification that they're covered. I mean, no. the, the old rule of thumb there is if you got it, you know, you live by the specs, you die by the specs, you know? So the question really is, is, is that something that blinds a lot of people? How do you manage that? I mean, in, in the context of our industry, it's hard to believe that, yeah, well, the spec is a guideline. People has a, they have a stroke. But I've seen people watch a process go to hell and because it was inside specs on everything, everything was fine. Like, what's up with that? Well, if it was in spec, then how would it, how would it be? The specs are inappropriate, right? Okay, I mean, well, the, there you go. Yeah, I mean, how did they come up with these, eh? Well, you go, I mean, eventually you have to go, if you're gonna go back to stage one, I mean, you go to the USP, the NF, the guidances, the um, CFR 210, 211, um, and you can basically, and I've done this, just build an audit checklist for every line item. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's painstaking, it, it's frustrating, and sometimes the answers that are there are not timely to, to find out. So sometimes there's a challenge in saying, hey, we need to, we need to focus on that. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of it comes back to a firm's ability if you look at things in their harsh reality of what happens yes in other words if you have a spec and everything is fine and everything is not fine you got to look and see well where is everything if it turns out that the spec is maybe it's either too wide or it's not telling you what you need to it's not controlling the process right if you have a specification and you're using a specification for for microbiology purposes the specification says you shouldn't have over 100 um, colony forming units for a sample. It's up to the company to set alert and action levels and then track and trend their alert and action levels. And hopefully by doing that, you'll never go over that, um, that mandated spec that's either in the USP or, or wherever that is. But it's up to the company. If, they wanna, if the spec limit is 100 and they want to set their alert limit at 95 and their action at 98 that's probably not a good idea you know i would maybe set an alert at 80 and action at 90 and of course you know an alert would um spur a deviation report you know if you get 90 it would spur an investigation and god forbid it goes over 100 you maybe have to do a little bit more maybe you look back at the validation is there a problem with the process? And then look at your critical control points. What could be um, what could be causing that? Is it the people? Is it the machinery? Is it is it the process? So you always have to keep you know if you do it right from the beginning, you identify all these points. 
um, it could be a great help later on. Say, so, okay, you know, we you know, we touched upon that. We thought that may be an issue, but we didn't we didn't know exactly how that would manifest itself, and now we're kind of seeing. So we can you know go back and, and use that and justify going forward. So let's bring this around to where we started. Okay, all so right. I'm getting started. I got a process. All right. right. Um, I give you, yeah. I say, hey, Joel, can you come on in here? I want to, I want to set critical. Yeah, you know, I want to see set my CQAs. I want to, you know, set this process in motion. Walk me through the steps here, and so that you know, when I get, when I finally get up, I know what I got to do. So, what do I got to? What do we you, need? You mean for from a regulatory standpoint, from a quality standpoint, or from a quality, quality standpoint, from a, a a system aspect, or for for a process? I mean, like for a process. For a process, um, when I say process, I mean you have something to look. that makes something, right? Yes. Okay. yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so other people process it the way you think, all right? Well, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, from a systemic level, you want to know how the vendors were chosen. Were the vendors qualified? Does the vendor's material come with C of A's? Are they tested against the C of A's? Are they documented uh, correctly? So from when a raw material comes in, gets scanned in sometimes, um, makes its way to the manufacturing floor, it gets uh, added into the, the product. From, from when that material comes in to, to, when, to where that product gets packaged, labeled, and shipped, you really want to understand that entire process. So and I should challenge the C of A's? Um, it depends. You, for me, yes. Not challenged. Confirm. Confirm. Yes. I don't. I don't. Yeah. See if appropriate. Yeah. Right. Just as an extra uh, line of due diligence. Okay. I, I would say um, not necessarily challenge, but but confirm. And usually you have a good relationship with with your vendor if you're making the same product over and over. Um, but you know, one product could have 20, 30 raw materials, so you have to. It is it is time consuming, but if you put all of that effort into getting the data, um, data on paper, you know, anything trending, um, even when you may think that it's, you know, useless. Why am I doing this? You know, what when something goes wrong, you know, you're going to look at two years worth of of data, investigations, deviations. Um, if there's a problem with your vendor, you know, if that one vendor is supplying five of your 20 raw materials, and those are those are the five materials that go out of spec, you may want to make a visit to the to the vendor location and say, hey, you know, this is what this is what we're seeing. Um, but understanding the entire process is really what um, the Q8 through Q10. Um, encourages and they encourage you know the people to be uh, empowered to input and not be hesitant in saying hey this could be a possible uh, critical control point um, but the un I mean the understanding of the entire process and the buy-in from people that are stakeholders it's it's great for morale um, everyone kind of knows what's going on and they feel that they could be helpful if they just, you know, bring up something, you know, you know, in a pr professional manner, and yeah, and address it, you know, before it before it becomes bigger. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Joel. And I think that uh, kind of wraps up our discussion on risk analysis, or at least what it should be looking like. And um, I can leave you with this, though. One of the comments that always strikes fear in my heart is not medically significant. Yeah. I've always found that that results in a catastrophic event. Right. With CSV, and when we do risk analyses for CSV, the bottom line is, is there risk to, to product safety? Is there risk to patient safety? And as long as it's no, anything goes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Russ. Thank you.